All right, we are here today with Sergeant Steve Hopper. He, uh, the interview is taking place in Greenfield, Illinois. It's April 25th, 2022. Sergeant Hopper was in the 9th Infantry Division, the 2nd Brigade, the 4th Battalion, is that correct? Of the yes, 47th sir. Regiment, Charlie Company, 3rd Platoon, and fought in Vietnam. And he was in Vietnam or in service from May of 66 through May of 1968. Um, so what I'll do today is uh, we'll just kind of have a conversation about your, you know, growing up and how you went into the military and everything. So where did you grow up? What was your life like growing up? I actually grew up on a farm and uh, nine miles north of Greenfield. In fact, our address was Root House, but we were in the Greenfield School District. A family of ten, um, eight children, four boys, four girls, two sets of twins, of which I was one of those sets had a twin sister and then Tom and Sue, the other set of twins. Uh, there was, uh, we grew up there learning how to uh, entertain ourselves. <laughs> we, there was no Facebook, there was no social media. Gosh, we had a party line as far as a phone, you know, in the house. And uh, what you did to entertain yourself was kind of whatever you thought about, whether it was going out in the woods and building tree houses and taking axes and saws and baling wire and hammer and nails and mom and dad just trusted us to look after each other and that's what we did. Anyway, did all kinds of things like that and we helped our dad farm. He, my dad was a farmer and uh, we all had chores to do on the farm. We had a garden that was about an acre it seemed when it started working it, you know every spring to raise a family of ten and uh, we raised our own beef, our own pork on the farm, our own garden. What was your day like? When I mean whenever you were helping your dad was it were you up at the, at the crack of dawn? And <laughs> yeah we were uh, as far as farming it was yeah we were up early get an early start go out and fuel the tractors up and uh, plow and of course farming was so different then because you plowed the field then you disked the field and then you finally planted the corn maybe where now it's so much faster with bigger implements. Uh, we had a four row planter and that was huge at that time where now they have 36 row planters and things of that nature. <laughs> anyway we yeah we worked in the fields uh, cutting you didn't have uh, you didn't have uh, crops that uh, were weed free we had to weed them by hand uh, we go out and with a weed hook and our machete and chop weeds out of corn and weeds out of beans and uh, come home and you know you you don't realize how much energy you've used but you come home for lunch and you sit down and eat five hamburgers and then you go back to work <laughs> again and do it all again in the afternoon but it's all manual labor so much of it was uh, and color. You were one of four boys. Is that right? One of four boys. Yes, yeah, three brothers and uh, the oldest one, Bill. Uh, when he was a senior in high school, Becky, the youngest in our family, the youngest sister, she was in first grade. Oh wow! So there was one year when all eight children, all eight kids, Hopper kids, were in school. Bill a senior and Becky first grade. <laughs> kind of interesting riding the bus that year. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> we were half the load, I think, our kid, our family was. But uh, anyway. Well, so um, so as you grew up, um, you know, what became obviously part of your makeup was hard work, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being able to put in long hours, mm -hmm. good strong farm kid. Yeah, How did that ended up. I mean, I think that probably was what ended up helping you later on when you got involved it, in the military. Yeah, it was. I uh, I worked long hours on the farm with Dad, but then there would be neighboring farmers that needed a young boy to help. They would hire me. Um, I remember working for a neighbor, Bill Gilmore. He uh, farmed about a thousand acres at the time, which was huge back in 1964 or 63 or so 
and I got paid a dollar an hour. And I remember uh, working 80 hour weeks so wow. I could get an $80 paycheck and that was huge back then. Um, and anyway, uh, in high school I played football. Uh, I wasn't huge in sports or baseball or anything like that. I played football for three years, met my wife, my fiance, who later became my uh, earlier, <laughs> well, met Jennifer, put it this yeah, way. Yeah. She was one year behind me and uh, she was a cheerleader and I was on the football team. Kind of never thought about it at the time, but it was kind of magic. Classic American Classic. story. Yeah. <laughs> and we started dating and uh, loved one another. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, she, uh, she became my purpose in life, was mm -hmm. to marry that young lady and, and uh, have her be by my side the rest of my life. So at what point did Vietnam start coming into your consciousness? After I graduated, well, when I was in high school, Vietnam was starting up. I graduated in 1965, and I didn't have the, the urge, uh, I guess the grades maybe, uh, the finances to go to college. And I went to work for a company in uh, Peoria, Illinois, Caterpillar Tractor Company. Had a great job. I went from a dollar an hour on the farm to two sixty-two an hour, mm -hmm. and worked not eighty hours a week, but forty hours a week. I thought, wow, wow how do they do this? Imagine <laughs> this, making three times as much money and half the time to do it. Anyway, I knew Vietnam was out there, and I was living with my brother Bill and his wife in Peoria at the time, uh, mm -hmm. single, uh, just living the dream, yeah. you know, making some money and and uh, I knew that it wasn't when I was going, it wasn't if I was going to get drafted, it was when. And then one day, mail was still coming to the farm and I was registered with the draft board with our farm address. Mm -hmm. And my dad called me one day and said, uh, Steve, you got your draft notice. So. Um, I took a military leave of absence from CAT mm -hmm. and uh, came home and uh, probably everything I owned was you know, a small suitcase. You know, I didn't have much at the time, didn't need much. And uh, reported for duty, uh, my dad took me to the bus stop there in Root House, Illinois, early one morning to get on the bus along with a bunch of other guys being drafted. And uh, as we left Root House and drove through Whitehall and then Carrollton and then Jerseyville and then Alton, every town we went through, we stopped and we picked up more guys being drafted. And a uh, couple of them I knew. Several of us got drafted that day, or, I mean, inducted. Uh, well, we did a physical and then we later got inducted. And, got on that same bus and went down to St. Louis and that was May of 68 or 66 and uh, May 17th and uh, we always kidded ourselves I will do our basic training and go to Germany when we all <laughs> knew we were going to Vietnam <laughs> that's that was so had the draft been going on for very long at that point? Uh, I mean, it's pretty early in the Vietnam War. It was pretty early in the Vietnam War, and of course later in the Vietnam War they, they had a lottery type arrangement. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't the case back then. Mm -hmm. I was drafted in 66, and uh, you were drafted based upon your classification. I was a 1A, which is about as good as you can be as mm -hmm. far as being a good candidate to be drafted. If you were married, that changed your classification. If you were married with children, and you had children, that again, or if you were in college, or uh, something of that nature, you know, it changed your classification. I, I was none of those. I was 1A. I was a prime candidate to be drafted. I had no <laughs> deferments, no, nothing that would, you know, prevent me from yeah. being drafted. Anyway, we took our uh, our oath mm -hmm. and it's in St. Louis. And it was so interesting because all of a sudden you now belong to them. You, you, you're just 
a piece of meat, you know. You're a soldier, and uh, they. Uh, so you got in the army. That's got in the army. Got yeah. drafted into the army, and um, we were took our oath of office in St. Louis, and they put us on some buses. After that took place, and they we didn't know where we were going, but it didn't matter if we knew. They nothing owned us. <laughs> There's nothing we could do about it. That's right. And anyway. We ended up in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And for 10 days, we, we spent about 10 days there. We learned how to march and we got uniforms and we got duffel bags full of stuff. And we took shots, got inoculations, and uh, we took all of these tests to see if there was a better fit for you besides the infantry, because that's where I was going to be, was the infantry. Well, there was a better fit. They wanted me to be a missile technician. Really? And I wasn't, yes. And I wasn't sure what that missile technician was, but it was a place to go down to train. After basic training, you would go to South Carolina. I think it was South Carolina, as I recall. And you would go through uh, three months or five months, six months of schooling for a missile, be a missile technician. And because of my grades and my uh, test results, they thought that would be a great fit for me. But it required enlisting another year in the Army. And <laughs> it's kind of funny, even though. I didn't know a lot of the guys. We all got to know each other pretty quick. When you're eating beside them, you're sleeping beside them, and everything else. Uh, and we all decided before we went into this building to get the results of our test that we were all going to just do our two years and get out. And uh, we all kind of promised each other that, you know. Well, as I went in and I found out that that's that's what they wanted me to do was be a missile technician. It meant signing up for another year and uh, I didn't do it. I thought no I'm gonna stick with my buddies out there. So you had had enough time with them that you already had developed an esprit de corps with these yes, guys yes. and you felt like you wanted to stay with that group. Oh yeah. Was that going to be the case? Did they break you guys up at some point? Or were you actually, did you get to go through well, your entire military experience with them? The area where we were stationed there at Fort Underwood, uh, and as I mentioned, we learned to march and we learned, uh, you know, we, we had breakfast together every morning, all of our meals obviously together. Well, out in the area, just outside of our barracks, they had a uh, a graveled area with four posts, with one through four on them, signs mm -hmm. on them. And uh, you wanting to come in? Yeah, come on through. Come on yeah. through, okay. sir. I can add anything out, so don't okay. worry about Sorry. it. <laughs> <laughs> they had a area that was graveled, and the four posts were there, and one through four. And every morning you lined up behind post four or behind post three, depending upon what barracks you were at. And, uh, One evening they called us all out to formation, so we're, we line up beside these posts or behind, on the post. And the sergeant in charge says, uh, tomorrow morning at 0530, I want every swinging deck out here with his duffel bag packed, ready to go. So we're out there with our duffel bags packed, st st standing beside us, heel to toe, you know, we're right behind the guy in front of us. And the sergeant said, and there's a bunch of mar uh, uh, buses over here to our right, uh, Greyhound buses. Yeah. And they said, everybody behind post one through three, get on the bus. So there we you went. Really were cattle, were you? <laughs> yeah, we were cattle. We got on the buses, threw our duffel bags in the bottom, got on the bus had no idea what was going on, but we ended up a few hours later, or several hours later, in Fort Riley, Kansas. Mm. And we were now part of the 9th Infantry Division. They had uh, reactivated the 9th. I didn't know this at the time, but General Westmoreland, who served in World War II and was now a general in, Viet in the Vietnam War, 
he was in the, the 9th Infantry Division, and that was deactivated after World War II concluded. Well, he needed a division of troops in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam to manage and control that area because it was um, basically wide open and it was the food source for so much of Vietnam, the rice and so forth. And uh, they needed a division of troops in, Viet in the Mekong Delta. And he went to D.C. and they decided to reactivate the 9th Infantry Division, which he had been a member of mm -hmm. in World War II. So now, here we are, Fort Riley, Kansas. I think the day before the troops arrived, there were nine people, eight or nine people in our division. And then we had thousands of guys arrive from buses and trains and airplanes from all over the country. Not a one did you know, ah. other than maybe a couple of the guys I rode from Whitehall with on the bus the day we got drafted, you know, the day we took our oath. And uh, K.E. Edwards and, and a guy called Bear. And uh, anyway, uh, they had buses and guys coming in from all over the country. And we were stationed up at Custer Hill, up on the top of the hill there at Fort Riley, Kansas. There was Camp Funkston and uh, Camp Forsyth and Custer Hill, and we were up on the hill. Um, didn't know anyone, so to speak, but we trained for six months. We trained basic training and then advanced training, unit, uh, AIT, Advanced Individual Training. Then we trained, uh, it went on from there. Normally every soldier goes through basic and AIT, but because we were going over together, we uh, trained basic unit training, a larger scale of training, uh, larger groups like a battalion versus just a squad or a platoon or a company, and then advanced unit training. We became, we, we became air mobile because in Vietnam we knew we would be using choppers and being transported back and forth by choppers. Uh, we went through uh, a mock-up village they had of uh, of a Vietnam hamlet, a Vietnamese hamlet, bil uh, buildings and straw and just thatch and hiding places and bunkers underground. That was all crafted for us and put together for us in Fort Riley, Kansas, out in the woods. And we, we had to go through and clear that village and make sure we took care of that. That was, all of our training was so focused on uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then we would spread the rumors that, well, we're going to Germany. We're going <laughs> to Germany. Thinking, and right. pretty soon everybody's talking about, hey, we're going to Germany. Did you hear that? Well, the next thing you know, they call us out in the formation, and the sergeant or the cap company commander says, I just want to clear something up here, boys. We're not going to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we had a lot of fun playing with stuff like that. But what was really interesting, day one, you knew no one. And six months later, we were brothers. Mm -hmm. um, I knew Bill's girlfriend. I knew Tom's girlfriend. I knew Joe's wife. I knew, we all knew each other. They knew Jennifer. Mm -hmm. They read Jennifer's, or they, I would share some of what Jennifer might write to them as they would with me. We shared care packages. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you were a huge family. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting, Ryan, is as that developed, and you didn't, you, you didn't realize it was developing until you were tested, I guess. <laughs> the, uh, the camaraderie and the respect we had for one another. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, it was incredible. Everybody had your back as you did then. Absolutely an incredible feeling. And we had gone through six months of really intense training. And uh, they deemed we were ready for Vietnam. 
So we graduated through all of this training at the end of 67. And or 66. Still Fort Riley, still at that we time? were still at Fort Riley. Okay. And uh, we, we graduated just before Christmas. Mm -hmm. They sent us on home leave for a week so we could be home for Christmas. And then we all reported back in to uh, Fort Riley. And uh, I was named the shipping NCO for Charlie Company. I was in Charlie Company and I was in the third platoon. I was a squad leader at the, or a team leader at the time. Uh, there was a squad leader and then two teams within a squad and I've headed up one of those teams. But I was named the NCO, the shipping NCO for Charlie Company, so I was in charge of getting all of our artillery, guns, ammo, weapons, everything out of our that gear, duffel bag, everything uh, was organized because we were put on a troop train at Fort Riley, Kansas, and uh, they loaded our gear and they put us in passenger cars, so to speak. And we went on a three-day train trip out to Oakland, California. And uh, right after, maybe, I guess right after the New Year, and uh, got everything, got our soul out there, and then we, <laughs> we pulled into Oakland, California on this train. A beautiful ride, going through the Rockies and going, just absolutely gorgeous ride. And uh, we pulled into Oakland, California to the shipyards there. And the train pulls in besides this huge ship, the USS General John Pope. And that was the troop ship that was going to take us to Vietnam. We didn't fly over, we went over on a troop ship. So we had trained together for six months and now we're going over to Vietnam as a unit. They put our entire brigade 2nd Brigade on that troop ship. So this would have been like roughly, uh, was this late 66, early 67? This would have been very early 67. Okay. We, uh, we arrived in country I think around January the 19th or something like that and it was okay. about a 19 day trip or 18 day trip on the ship. And uh, they got us loaded, they got the troops on, they got the gear on overnight and the next morning we uh, lifted anchor and off we went underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and gosh I remember looking at that from the bottom side and pretty pretty Think crazy all moment. The, all the soldiers that have seen the same thing. Yeah. Doing the same thing, yeah. leaving the yeah. U.S. to go fight overseas. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. It was um, kind of a I don't know if the word is magic. Pretty incredible moment. Uh, we were so tight as a group. And that had its advantages. But once you got on that ship and we, you had this group of brothers you were with and dear friends, you know, guys, you would just do anything for any of them. And once you got on the ship and we lifted anchor and we took off to Vietnam, went underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, reality kind of sets in that, wow. And you're looking around and you know some of us won't make it back. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that was the hard part of uh, thinking about that because it, it, it weighed on your mind. Uh, would I be one of the ones that wouldn't make it back? Uh, would my training be sufficient to get me and my boys and my guys and my brothers through this? Pretty crazy because once we got in Vietnam and uh, your training takes over once that first round is fired. <laughs> it. Uh, you wonder how you're going to react, but it's it's pretty automatic. Your training takes over, and pretty soon the last shot's fired. You don't know when that's going to be, but pretty soon it's quiet. Mm -hmm. You know. So this had been your first trip out of the U.S. 
Is that correct? Yes. Whenever you went under the Golden Gate Bridge, that was your first time leaving the U.S. How did it feel knowing everything you know was in the rearview mirror at that point and you're going over that horizon to parts unknown? Uh, I mean, good thing is you're with a ship full of other guys in the same boat. No yeah, <laughs> we're all in the same boat, so to speak. You know, we're we're going overseas, and there are so many unknowns, and there's so many new things now that you're experiencing. There's so many new things that you have just experienced in your last six months of training. Did you get seasick on the boat at all? Oh, I was. A lot of guys that I I was so sick. To, really? Yeah. I remember going down the first morning out. We were out on the ocean and. We, we went through some bad storms, we had some bad seas, then we had some days the water was like glass and it was beautiful. But I lost 30 pounds in 19 days on that show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you, you know, you, you go down for breakfast like it's no big deal. And you're standing up, you, you eat standing up, you're not sitting down and uh, they throw this stuff on your tray and you couldn't recognize it, but yet it was edible, I guess. And then two guys down from you, he's thrown up into his tray and pretty soon you just kind of give up on it. What about the vaunted Navy food? Isn't that supposed to be a it wasn't. great chow? Well, I stuff? think uh, I understood, as I recall, that our Army cooks and the Navy cooks were going to try to work this thing together. And because uh, we had good food at Fort Riley, Kansas. And Charlie Company, Sergeant Smitty, was our, our cook. And uh, he ran a good mess hall. And we had great food. And uh, you know, it's funny, when I got drafted, I was 165 pounds after six months of training in Fort Riley, Kansas. I mean, you're busy and you're working hard every day. You're calisthenics, you're running miles before breakfast and after dinner. I was 195 and I was, yeah, you know, built Sacked. and we were all <laughs> felt pretty tough. And then 19 days later after a ship ride, I'm back to 165 again. But it was probably good that I took that weight off before Vietnam because uh, Vietnam would take it off of you. You know, we, uh, the heat, the humidity, the sea rations, you yeah. know, uh, you lose weight. So when you got to Vietnam, what was it like when you pulled in? What were your thoughts? We pulled into a port. Vong Tau, that we later got to go to for a day of R&R &R after we'd been there for six months or so. And, but it was an absolute beautiful beach and buildings and uh, just kind of like a tourist spot, you know. We were out on the decks of the ship the night before we unloaded dark and you can kind of see the skyline uh, and you could see off in the distance a string of tracers coming down from a helicopter and then you could obviously they let go of the trigger because that string you could follow that last tracer down and realizing every fifth round was a tracer, it looked like a solid red line, but every fifth round was a tracer in those, in our machine guns. And you thought, well, somebody's going through some stuff out there tonight, and they've got fire support from a helicopter. And uh, you begin thinking, talking to each other, talking to your buddies. We're standing out there on their decks, and it's 95 degrees and it's humid, you're standing there in your underwear because it's so hot and you're just starting to imagine what this year is going to look like because we had a 12 months tour ahead of us and in January 67 through January 68 and uh, Did you know then you were going to be in the Mekong River Delta? Yes. Okay. Yes. The next day they brought boats out and we unloaded, we loaded onto those boats with our duffel bags and they offloaded us there and we didn't know what to expect, you know, I mean, it's, but there was a band, 
waiting for us with our banner, uh, 9th Infantry Division uh, uh, flag. And uh, we unloaded, got onto the beaches. They put us on deuce and a half. So there was a band, as I mentioned, a band was playing, welcoming us and other soldiers. And uh, we got on deuce and a half with our M16s and our gear, our duffel bag, and off we went. We didn't know where we were going. But again, you belong to them, so, you know. We ended up at a place called Bearcat, and that was our division base camp. And it was really nice. It had barracks, and it was uh, dry. The roads, I mean, the streets were dry. I had a nice mess hall. I think later on in life, as we went through Vietnam, it had a, actually a swimming pool there at Bearcat. We never got to enjoy it, but that I recall anyway. Uh, and we spent about two months at Bearcat. And we would go out on day patrols or overnight patrols. And it was just kind of getting our feet wet, kind of letting us get the feel for the land, uh, the smells, the, the jungles, the rice paddies. The... We ran into a few skirmishes, but uh, I think in the couple of months that we were working out of base camp, we uh, we only lost one or two guys, which is sad to lose one. Mm -hmm. But then after that two months, we were transferred down to Dongtan, in the right in the Mekong Delta on the Saigon or on the Mekong River, and uh, <laughs> we got there, and there were no barracks, there were no bunkers. There was nothing done other than they had dredges out in the river pumping silt up into this area to build it up for a base camp. So we slept in the mud for a few nights. We started building bunkers, building uh, protection. So if there was artillery or mortar fire coming in from the enemy, there were trenches to get down into and there was uh, uh, some sandbag cover cover. And then, of course, the, uh, the engineers were there and they were building an airfield for uh, planes to be able to land and choppers and so forth. And uh, it became quite a place. Um, we eventually had barracks that were just single story tents, but they were built up on wooden floors so you were off the ground. Mm -hmm and um, got a mess hall, uh, got some showers installed, and uh, so you could stay clean and uh, take care of your hygiene, you know. Sure. Anyway, uh, we, got to, we got into Dong Tam and then we uh, started going out not only by foot, but we also went out by helicopters and were brought back by helicopters. Um, and we became part of a joint Army-Navy effort called the Mobile Riverine Force. What was that again? Global? Mobile. Mobile. Mobile Riverine Force. The Mobile Riverine Force was a group of... How do you spell Riverine? R-I-V-E-R-I-N-E. -E. Okay. Just Riverine, like yeah. They were a group of... Uh, naval guys and they had two ships out in the Mekong River there just adjacent to our base camp and they had a barge tied to them and then off of those barges they had LSTs tied up mm -hmm. side by side uh, landing craft for carrying troops they um, the beauty about that type of uh, duty was the ships were air-conditioned mm. So you could be out in the heat and the humidity and the mud and on patrols for two or three days and you'd get back to the ship. They would, the soldiers, the sailors would wash us down with fire hoses as we got <laughs> up onto the barges because we were covered with mud and whatever else. And, uh, but once you got inside, you could shower. You had a nice air-conditioned bunk. 
you had all yeah, of the comforts, humidity no stuff. humidity oh. to deal with, and uh, that was really a nice thing. But I tell you, going out on these boats, and then some of these LSTs had a landing pad on them, so a helicopter could actually land on top mm -hmm. of these boats. These incredible that they could do this because it was like landing something on a they did it but we would go out on these patrols and uh, we saw action just about every week we would go on maybe two patrols three patrols a week maybe a day long two days long three days long depending and it, we'd go out on these boats at three o'clock in the morning and they buzz up and down these rivers and uh, narrow streams and then they get to our drop-off point and they drop the ramp get up on the shoreline drop the ramp and you're stepping off into mud and leeches and god only knows what you're going to step into were you facing primarily uh the north vietnamese or was it Viet Cong that you were Viet Cong. Doing? okay yeah it was uh in the mekong delta it was that was the rice bowl of the country that's where so much of their food was grown, um, and it was all Viet Cong. Uh, there was no North Vietnamese Army soldiers, per se, there. It was all Viet Cong, guerrilla warfare, trenches, uh, uh, bunkers that were built into the dikes that were absolutely camouflaged to, per to perfection. I mean, you just difficult to spot the enemy. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, uh, as we look back at it and we, we realized then, we were bait, mm. you know, we were just bait. We would get wow. dropped off in a landing zone and sometimes it was a hot landing zone, we'd be fired upon as we were coming in and that's not fun. How many people at a time typically were you were in your group as you were coming in? We would be bringing a platoon in at a time, uh, maybe a squad or a half a squad on each chopper. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a, a platoon basically consists of about four squads. So you could have six or eight choppers coming in together, dropping off a platoon or a squad, uh, yeah, a platoon. and. Um, Hopefully your LZ was cool and it was it was calm that day you landed, but so many times they weren't, and we take casualties on the way in, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the door gunners on the choppers were uh, phenomenal guys. <laughs> <laughs> they had the M60s on both sides, and they provided a lot of cover for you as we would go into these places. Uh, and then a lot of times was we came into an LZ, they would throw a barrage of artillery into that LZ before we arrived. So kind of clear it out. And uh, a lot of times we would, as we landed, Ryan, there would still be red ants falling out of the sky, you know, from where the turtle came stopped. in and blew yeah. things up. And these red ants flew. It would still be dropping out of the sky. It was incredible. They were. They were pretty nasty little critters. Um, it was interesting because you didn't have just the enemy to deal with. You know, you had the heat, the humidity, maybe a 60 or 80 pound backpack. If we knew we were getting into a lot of heat or a lot of enemy we uh, based upon intelligence, we all wore extra bandoliers of M60 ammo on us, grenades, um, some sea rations. A lot of times we get replenished of a night if they could with sea rations and fresh water. Um, then you've got the mosquitoes and the leeches and the, just all of the different things you're dealing with. And uh, it was incredible though. When you, when you were dropped off with your guys at these places, how long were these missions typically? Were you there for days, or were you there? You might for be there for uh, w once we were dropped off on a in a landing zone. We might be there for the day to search uh, and maybe 
search a village, yeah. do a search and destroy, or go in and do goodwill for a village and bring things to them, medications and things of that nature. It wasn't all um, intended to mm -hmm. take someone out. Mm -hmm. It was intended to help too. We did a lot of uh, uh, missions that way. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but you likewise, you could very easily be out there for three days, and you might be go out by helicopter and then be picked up by boat based upon where you were going to end up, you know. And um, it's interesting uh, how you would use your compass. We did compass training mm -hmm. and stepping off distances when we were at Fort Riley training, and it was absolutely incredible how good we were at this in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And here you're navigating rivers and streams and we know we need to go a thousand meters uh, at a particular azimuth. And uh, when we thought we were at the right spot and looking at the maps and looking at the terrain, we would ask the artillery to fire a marking round to which exploded in the air um, and sometimes it would go off right over us because we were that close to being where and we needed wanted to be. That. And so we wanted yeah. that. And then sometimes you couldn't even see it. <laughs> you could hear it go off, but it's out of sight. So you knew you were a little bit off. But that was important to know that because if you had to call artillery in, yeah. we they knew where we were. and we knew where we were kind of on, on target. So you mentioned the M16 earlier. Um, what was your thoughts on the M16? I thought it was a pretty phenomenal weapon. Yeah. 20 round clips, um, you had a single, you could fire it in a single shot or you could put it in AR and mm -hmm. automatic rifle. Had they just, do you recall, had they just been issued? Were they brand new? They were whatever? pretty new to us. We, When we trained at Fort Riley, Kansas, we actually trained, I think, with the M4 or M14. 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 And, uh, but late in our training, we got the M16. Mm -hmm. So we learned how to clean it, how to disassemble it, how to take care of it. It was somewhat of a, <laughs> what's the term I want to use? temperamental weapon. That was what I was thinking. That's yeah. what I had heard from Somewhat of a temperamental weapon. You had to keep it clean. And uh, we operated in some areas uh, off of the coast of Vietnam or on the coast of Vietnam that was salt water. Well, in the Delta, we were in rivers and we were in salt water and you were sometimes crossing a stream on a rope. Mm -hmm. And we spent a lot of time in the mangrove swamps, uh, which was a saltwater salt water area mm -hmm. along the coast. And our ammo would get corroded if we didn't use it. It would get corroded in the magazines really? and uh, wow. it, from the salt water. Mm -hmm. So. And you, you don't want that when you're in the middle of a battle. You want every round to fire uh, and to feed through that magazine. Anyway, uh, we learned very quickly that the care you gave your M16 and the magazines included, we would soak them in oil. We would uh, keep the, uh, the M16 pristine on the inside. I mean, it, we you cleaned it every day. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you, what you were doing or where you were, you cleaned your M16 every day, if not more than once. Uh, there was times uh, it was below water mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'd pick it up and drain the water out of the barrel before you shot, you know, you just, but it performed well if you took care of it. Kept it clean and kept it lubricated. Mm -hmm. I liked the weapon and it was lightweight, mm -hmm. very lightweight to handle. I don't know, we didn't have scopes, it was all iron sights, but I I qualified expert with it 
out of Fort Riley as we all went through training and mm -hmm. learning how to fire a rifle and of course we had learned that on the farm back mm -hmm. as kids. We mm -hmm. hunted and... Uh, so how did your, I mean did, at any point did you start realizing that you as a farm kid, you know a corn fed strapping farm kid that's used to putting in long days, did you ever notice that you had maybe a little bit better of a, I guess, uh, background for that, you know, for, for the days in Vietnam compared I think to so. city kids? You know? I think so. Uh, <laughs> I think having been around brothers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as a kid, having three brothers and four sisters and a family, a very, very strong family unit. Uh, you develop that same family unit with the guys you were serving with now. And uh, you all became family. I don't know if we, as 19 year olds, that we realized all of this at that time. Mm -hmm. But boy, do we look back at it now. It, we have reunions and we reminisce and we look back at the camaraderie. Mm -hmm. uh, the love we have for each other, mm -hmm. knowing each other's girlfriends and wives and children, and um, pretty incredible mm -hmm. the relationship you develop with these guys. And uh, it's pretty crazy what you would do for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you and I do it again. Mm -hmm. I do it again. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen where I have to do it again. Because mm -hmm. if it does happen at 75 years old, <laughs> it better happen real quick. Because I need to get in there and get it over and get out of there, you know. But... Uh, so you had three three brothers. Mm -hmm. and yes. Did they serve in Vietnam? Uh, two of my brothers did. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill was the oldest, and then Tom, and then myself, and then Roger. Um, Tom when we were kids and we got a TV for the first time and we watched combat with Vic Morrow on TV, Tom was on the edge of his chair. He was eating this combat stuff up, this army stuff up. And the day Tom graduated from high school and then turned 18, he enlisted in the army. That's all he wanted to do was be a soldier. And he spent 23 years successful years in the army and he spent a lot of time in Europe, uh, in Germany and other places I'm sure in Europe, but he did spend a year in Vietnam. He came home from Vietnam and uh, while I was at Fort Riley, Kansas training for Vietnam. I had gotten drafted as I mentioned and, and, and he, he came home in like October of or November of 66 we finished up our training in 66, went to Vietnam in 67, it's been a year. I come home from Vietnam and my brother Bill, while I was in the army, uh, Bill, my brother Bill got drafted, the older mm -hmm. of the th of four of us. And uh, he was in the army as well, all three of us in the army. And Bill, uh, the night I came home from Vietnam, Jennifer picked me up at the airport. She had the wedding all planned. We were going to, we were engaged while I was in Vietnam. And anyway, as part of this story goes on, she picked me up at St. Louis and she brought me to her mother and dad's home. We had a, a reunion there, uh, a welcome home party. And uh, Bill and Sue were there, my brother Bill. And after the evening kind of settled down in the excitement and so forth, we had dinner and we're sitting there in the kitchen at my mother-in-law's home that evening and dad and mom and Bill and Sue and some other family members in there. And dad says, uh, hey, Bill's getting ready to make a little trip. And I says, hey, Bill, are you getting transferred to a different post or something? He said, I go to Vietnam this month. Oh. 
And I told my mother while I was in Vietnam, I was wounded twice, and after I was wounded the second time, I got transferred out of the infantry. And I was, a mili I was in the military police in Long Bend, and I was in charge of security at an ammunition dump. Huge acres and acres of ammunition. And they were all stored in these bunkers around the the the, uh, the base. And we had security guys out there, soldiers and towers and dogs and walking the perimeter and various things. Had a command center, and uh, I was in a pretty good area compared to where I'd been, you know. So I told mom, I said, let me know if Bill's going to have to come to Vietnam, because Bill only had like. 11 months left at the time I came home. I said, but let me know and I'll extend mm -hmm. and Bill won't have to come. Mm. I felt I'm in a pretty good place now. Mm -hmm. Was Bill married? Bill was point? married, okay. yes. No children. Mm -hmm. What's the designation when you're married? Because you said you're 1A. I've I was, always wondered this. What's, uh, what's I'm going that? to say like um, 2A. Okay. 2A. And then married with children, maybe 3A. Okay. Um, I know 4F was, you know, not fit, you know. Yeah, for, unfit. For 4F was, yeah, yeah. Not unfit. But anyway, uh, Mom wrote back to me and said, the Bill's fine. He's okay. You need to come home. And uh, you've got a wedding that Jennifer's planned. And so I came home. Anyway, I was a bit shocked that night, mm -hmm. the night I got home, uh, in so many ways. <laughs> I was surprised I made it because yeah. I shouldn't be sitting here today talking about some of this stuff. I feel like uh, the good Lord carried me so many days yeah. of my life. And he still does, mm -hmm. you know. He still does. So so talk about your brothers. Uh, so three out of the four of you, uh, so Tom and Alyssa and you and Bill were drafted. Um, how did your mom and dad feel about their boys all getting pulled in to this thing? Uh, you know, was there any, uh, you know, everybody thinks about the Sullivans during World War II yeah. and yes. what happened with them and that changed how, uh, during the war, how they would deploy a lot of, you know, and even with like, uh, for instance, D-Day, the Bedford boys, the ones that were all from Virginia on one landing craft and the landing craft got taken out and the little town of Bedford, Virginia lost you know, 30 of their young men all at once, you know. And obviously things like that still weigh on people's mind. I just wondered if, you know, that's a pretty extenuating circumstance to have three out of the four boys mm -hmm. um, getting pulled into Vietnam yeah. in the military. What did, what did your parents I I, I, that? I felt bad for my parents. I, because uh, while I was at a, bad place in the world at the time. Uh, I thought about the worry that mom and dad must have gone through. Yeah. And I remember Tom, I saw an article, a newspaper article, or a letter he wrote home to mom and dad when he was in Vietnam that uh, they weren't getting enough food and where he was stationed in Vietnam, they weren't getting the proper amount of food to serve all of the troops. And uh, I remember my mother wrote an article to our congressman about that, that here we are, the land of plenty, but yet when we send our troops to war, they're not being properly fed and taken care of, so to speak. Pretty good letter, Mom wrote it. So I, uh, I, I saw that later in life, but during that time, uh, I, I think I, uh, knowing that they were worried, my letters I sent home to them, I've seen many of them, they kept them. I got to see them after I came home. It was kind of interesting how I wrote to them. I didn't share a lot of the, I didn't share much of what we experienced in Vietnam with them. I didn't want them 
to worry. Rather, I ask how they were doing. Dad, how are the crops doing? Dad, did you get that rain you needed? Or, Dad, did you get too much rain that you wanted? You know, hey, how's my, how's my sister Sandy doing? My, or how's Becky and Penny? How's school going for them? I focused on so many other things outside of what I was experiencing. It was um, an escape for you. It was an escape, I guess. And they I remember the... wanted to protect them, too. Yeah. Not dwell on... Make them worry about it. Yeah. And I remember... Uh, it was interesting because I didn't realize this happened until after it happened. I got wounded uh, June 1st. The first time I was wounded was June 1st of 67. We were out on a place just outside of our base camp in the Mekong River, uh, an island that we called VC Island mm -hmm. or Booby Trap Island because it was loaded with VC snipers and so forth and booby traps. Well, we were going to go clean it out one day, our unit was. And Charlie Company got on the boats and they took us up or down the river there to this island and we started getting sniper fire before we even unloaded, unloaded off the boats. And I woke up that morning, before this even happened, I woke up that morning and I didn't have a good feeling about the day. Something was going to happen to Steve Hopper. I felt it. I even told my platoon sergeant, Joe Marr, I said, Joe, I, or Sergeant Marr, I said, do I really have to go today? Well, yeah, you're a squad leader. I said, I don't feel good about this. And uh, he says, well, I, I need you. You got to be. I said, I know that. Mm -hmm. I just, but I had to ask. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I just didn't feel good about the day. And then the other thing that was turned out to be comical about the day, I didn't have a clean pair of trousers to wear. So I borrowed a pair from my medic. We were all a size 30 waist at that time, or 28, whatever, medium, small uniforms. We all wore the same clothing almost the same size. So Doc Taylor, our medic, Elijah Taylor from Texas, he, uh, here Hop, you can wear a pair of my trousers. So I put them on, they fit perfect. We got all geared up, got ammo, got loaded, everything ready to go. We get on the boats, we go out there. And a couple of hours in, got off the boats because we'd gotten sniper fire and we took out the sniper and we finally unloaded and we were going out through the through the rice paddies and jungles. Um, I tripped a booby trap, a hand grenade, belted against my boot, the string. It was down in some heavy grass and uh, it went off about a foot behind me. Well, I had a flak jacket on and a backpack, so it, that kept it out of my back area. But my rear end and my legs and my lower arms were just absolutely uh, peppered or really torn up pretty good from the shrap shrapnel. Uh, didn't throw me through the air like you see on TV, but it sure moved me. Anyway, as soon as it they heard the explosion, uh, somebody yelled medic, and uh, Doc Taylor comes running over to me. And uh, I'm looking at myself, I'm dripping blood and looking around, I thought, I was still very conscious and aware of what had happened. And I go to sit down and Doc Taylor says, hey Hopper, don't sit down, you've got shrapnel sticking out of your legs and your, oh, man. your butt, you know, your buttocks. And, your arm, so he started pulling some of this out of me. And then he started cutting my pant legs away on the back of my trousers that were shredded. And finally he got them pretty well pieces that he saw pulled out. And he says, Hopper, those are my pants, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and Oh my God, we just started laughing. Oh, 
man, look at my pants, Hopper. And he just, anyway. Two, four years ago, we had a reunion in 2018 in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Charlie Company reunion, and Doc Taylor was there. And I gave him his pants back. I went out and bought a new pair of trousers. Oh, okay. Him. I was like, how did you do that? And I got his <laughs> pants. I finally... I got to be the MC at that reunion, and uh, I said, I, I, said I, I got a debt that I've owed for 52 years, <laughs> and I want to pay it back tonight, and I want to have witnesses that I paid this guy back. But yeah, I went to a military surplus store, bought a pair of trousers, and uh, gave them back to Doc that night. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that. But uh, anyway, it's funny how in the middle of of uh, being wounded in a kind of a difficult moment. In the middle of enemy territory. Yeah, you know. enemy territory still. Um, we're standing there laughing over the fact that... That's amazing. Yeah. Fun so time. that was, you, you've got two Purple Hearts, is that right? Yes, sir. And the first one was, was this one? It was that day. What happened? How did you get the second one? Uh, we were out. This was in October. This was my last mission. Uh, with the 9th Infantry Division. We were out on patrol and my squad uh, was the point squad for our platoon and our platoon was point for the company so everybody was behind us and my squad was right out in the front leading the way and we just stepped out of a tree line um, and we got orders to stop where we were and kneel down. So we stopped out in the middle of this rice paddy. We knelt down. I told my guys, says, "Hey, we're getting getting an update here. Hang on, keep your eyes open." Oh, hold on a second. I think my tape might have ended. It's about to. I'm gonna go ahead and stop it. Okay. And then we'll switch tapes for while. Otherwise, you'll be talking and it'll shut off, and I'll have to make you start over like I just did anyway. So. You want any more coffee? I'm good right now. Are you? Yeah.